But in order to give him a proper introduction, I've asked Max Glenn to please come up and do that. I feel privileged to be able to introduce a friend to my friends in yachts. And I think I want to begin with welcome home, Bill. Bill tells me that his mother began coming to Yahats in 1940. His first trip to Yahats was when he was five years old in 1964, and he has many memories from that, but they returned to Yahats every summer through his college years. And then in 19, what was 87, when you had an opportunity to come back to uh, the Central Coast, his relationship with Yahats was one of the things that really attracted him. Bill graduated from Pacific University with a Bachelor's of Arts in uh, Communications from Northwest University with a Master's degree in Journalism. Some people will remember his voice from the radio, but he was elected. I have to look at my notes to get how many times. Bill was first elected in, in 2004 as County Commissioner for Lincoln County, elected again in 2008 and again in 2012. So you're in your third term. So it's a real joy to welcome you to Yahats for this presentation. Thank you, Max. Thank you for really a wonderful introduction and thank you for uh, uh, such a warm welcome to the place that I've always considered a home away from home uh, for all the reasons that you described. Uh, Talk about uh, Yahat's roots. I mean, my mother remembers. Anybody remember Beulah's? Yeah. Of course. And she remembers eating at Beulah's when Beulah was still there. And she also said she remembered, this was somewhere in the late 40s, visiting the house where the Yahat's telephone switchboard was located. The woman who was the switchboard operator called, uh, you know, worked out of her house. I mean, what, what a great piece of history. So I'm very excited to be here today, very excited to have an opportunity to kick off my tour to promote my new book called Macaulandia, a utopian novel. And I want to thank everybody who's already bought copies. What a great kickoff this is going to be. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Tom McCall, who is the main subject of the book, and uh, read an excerpt or two or three and be glad to take questions and uh, let's kick it off. The inspiration for this book came from a single photograph. This was taken by the great Salem photojournalist Jerry Lewin, 1967, at was what was then Parker Stadium in Corvallis. University of Southern California was going to be playing Oregon State in football. That was one of the games for the ages, if you're a college football fan at all. The giant killers of Oregon State beat USC three to nothing. <laughs> Go Beavers. Well, two years ago was the centennial of Tom McCall's birth. He was born in 1913. And there was a lot of celebration of Tom McCall's time in office. And uh, Matt Love, a lot of you know, and of course he was last month's program, uh, wrote a blog post where he said that photograph inspired him. And he said, someday I'm going to write a novel. The premise will be, instead of Ronald Reagan, Tom McCall was the Western governor who became president of the United States. And I'm going to call that book McCallandia. Well, that hit me like a thunderbolt because Matt and I have been friends for years. We share a great admiration for Tom McCall. And I have a particular passion for the genre called alternate history. So a few nights later, I saw Matt and I said, would you consider collaborating on this, maybe? And he said, no, Bill, I think the universe means for you to do it. I'm really never going to get around to it. So here's the result. Off the presses this week, and the first copies available right here, this is McCallandia. So let me ask, 
How many of you were in Oregon when Tom McCall was governor? Okay, so a lot of folks remember the McCall governorship. And how many of you would maybe say that you moved to Oregon in part at least because of the things that Tom McCall did and the reputation he helped create for the state? Okay, so clearly, uh, clearly a lot of us uh, know the Oregon we live in today has been shaped by Tom McCall. So what's this book all about? As I mentioned, I'm a big fan of alternate history, and here are just three examples of the genre. Basically, it's taking historical settings, historical characters, and then having what the writers call a point of departure. Something significant changes and history takes a different direction from there. That first book, Bring the Jubilee, was published in the 1950s and it is probably considered the classic uh, account of a world where the South wins the Civil War. Hitler victorious, that probably is self-explanatory. And then Surrounded by Enemies. This was uh, one of several books that came out just a couple of years ago, imagining a world where John F. Kennedy survived Dallas. And I've included that one in part because Bryce Zabel was born in Newport, grew up in Portland, and he provided a very nice blurb for my book. So if the premise of a world where Kennedy survives interests you, I would encourage you to look up his book. But in addition to being alternate history, those of you who have the book or picked it up and looked at it might notice the heading, a utopian novel. And I really think in a lot of ways, Macaulandia is in the spirit of Ecotopia. And uh, are a lot of you at least familiar with Ecotopia, heard of it if you haven't read it. Uh, published in 1975, set in the far future, 1999 at the time, and imagines a world where the Western states have uh, broken away from the United States and formed their own ecological paradise. And this is something that I've really got to give a little more thought to, but it seems like there aren't many utopian novels written. Dystopia is far more popular, but I like a positive vision. That's what I've tried to convey in this book, and uh, hopefully you'll, you'll agree as well. So I mentioned the point of departure, and in this case, the point of departure in world history comes in October of 1973. Now, Richard Nixon was already deep in the morass of Watergate. And just totally separate from Watergate, a scandal involving Vice President Spiro Agnew came to the forefront. Now there's Tom McCall with Spiro Agnew. And if you know anything about the history of Tom McCall, you know those two men did not care for each other one bit. <laughs> uh, in the 1970 Governor's Conference, Spiro Agnew gave a rather rip-roaring speech attacking um, governors who did not, or people who did not hew to the party line. And it was pretty clear that Tom McCall was his main target. And this is kind of ironic, I think, because, uh, you know, for one thing, even though uh, there had been a lot of disagreements between the McCall administration and the Nixon administration, McCall was very solidly behind uh, Nixon in Vietnam, in part, but only in part, because his own son was a uh, uh, Navy commander at, at the time. But uh, nevertheless, in classic McCall fashion, uh, when a reporter cornered him uh, after Agnew's talk, he asked him what he thought about it, and he said, it was a rotten, bigoted little speech. <laughs> <laughs> so, Spiro Agnew pretty quickly had to resign. And what really happened is the man on the right in that picture Michigan Congressman Gerald Ford, the former House Republican leader, rather quickly emerged as Congress's favorite for the appointment, 
and uh, Richard Nixon went ahead and appointed Gerald Ford as vice president. But I said, let's imagine a different world. Let's imagine a world where Nixon instead digs in his heels and says, no, I don't want good old Jerry Ford. They're trying to force me out. They're trying to, and if Jerry Ford's in there, that will just make it all the easier. I want an unknown. I want a maverick. I want somebody that Congress won't trust, that they won't know. And so Alexander Haig, his chief of staff, comes to him with the name of Tom McCall. Now, before the talk, we were talking, I was talking with someone about the Oregon Beach Bill, and Matt Love calls this picture the most iconic photograph in Oregon history, and I tend to agree. That was taken in 1967, the Surf Sand Motel at Cannon Beach. And you can see those driftwood logs that McCall is standing by. The owner of that motel tried to fence off and declare that area a private beach. That was maybe one of the more egregious examples, but there were others along the coast. Now, people have heard perhaps of the 1913 beach bill where the Oregon legislature, this was sponsored by the governor at the time, Oswald West, uh, put through a bill declaring the beaches to be public highways forever open to the public. But the problem was, the main problem was that eventually that was interpreted by the courts only to mean what they called the wet sand areas of the beach, the up to essentially the high tide line. And the beach bill that McCall eventually championed essentially extended that all the way up to the vegetation line. So it's October 1973, Tom McCall is appointed President, the Vice President of the United States. So I've, I've got to admit, I've got some pretty audacious goals for this book, at least five of them. I hope it will give you a new understanding of Tom McCall's governorship. I hope it will help you understand how the country might have taken a different path in the 1970s and 80s with different leadership. I hope it will help you understand Tom McCall as a human being Hope it might inspire you to help carry his legacy forward. And I also hope you'll enjoy a very good read. So, some of the iconic pictures and moments of the McCall governorship. The bottle bill, of course. And there he is with uh, Clay Myers, the Secretary of State. Oregon was the first state to do a bottle bill. About nine others have followed. But do you think President McCall would have pushed for a national bottle bill? You know, before getting into elected politics, uh, Tom McCall, he had worked for Governor Douglas McKay for a few years, but most of his working life was spent as a journalist. The last eight years before he was elected uh, as a political commentator, documentary filmmaker for KGW-TV in Portland, that is a still from Pollution in Paradise a documentary that aired on KGW-TV in 1962, and a Willamette Week piece uh, on the 50th anniversary of Pollution in Paradise said that was when modern Oregon was born. That was really uh, the dawning of uh, environmental awareness in the general public. You know, certainly people for decades had been uh, trying to say we couldn't use our rivers as open sewers anymore, we couldn't keep uh, exhausting things into the air without any regard to the consequences, but that lit the firestorm. Anybody uh, have a guess as to why Tom McCall is signing this bill in 1971 on a bicycle seat? Yes, because that was the very first bill that actually allocated a share of highway money for uh, walking paths and bike trails. Okay, can anybody tell me what this event is? Put your hand up, please, if you know. Okay, uh, right here, yes. Okay. Vortex, Vortex 
one, a biodegradable festival of life. And I think uh, this is really, at least to me, really kind of the turning point in Tom McCall's governorship. It's the summer of 1970, you know, two years after the Chicago Democratic National Convention, the American Legion is holding its annual convention in Portland, and the word has gone out around the country. Uh, there are reports from the FBI that half a million young protesters are going to be descending on downtown Portland, and the fear of violence was very high. Four young people had an idea, and they got in their battered old car and drove down to uh, Salem. And one of the thrills in my journey on this book was meeting one of those who, now not so young people, although still young in spirit, a man named Lee Meyer. And they got right in to meet with Tom McCall's chief of staff, Ed Westerdahl, and pitched the idea of a state-sponsored rock festival to draw the young people away from downtown Portland and prevent violence. And so it was carried right up to Tom McCall. The staff gave the pros, the cons. You know, they foresaw a lot of what did happen in the aftermath that uh, people would say, you know, the governor's sponsoring a giant orgy, a pot party, all the rest. But they said McCall listened and finally, with a finger waving in the air, he said, I have just committed political suicide. <laughs> I have decided to have Vortex One. And it really did take an act of, I think, unusual courage to do something like this. No state government had ever done anything remotely like it before. McCall was running for re-election. And, you know, in the with the gift of hindsight, we really see him as uh, the great uh, you know, the great leader that he became in the second term, not that there weren't some great things that happened in the first term, but really the McCall magic came to full flower in the second term. He was in what was a pretty tough fight for re-election, and it was a huge gamble, but he believed in his heart of hearts that it was the thing to do. So, I think it's time for a reading, maybe. Let me share this scene with you. This is from chapter three of the book, and I'm partial to it because it's actually a revised version of the very first scene that I wrote. So just to set the stage a little bit, um, you've got the opening chapter of the book, which is the state funeral for President McCall in 1983. Chapter two is called Fear and Loathing on the Oregon Coast. Uh, I tried to put my journalism skills to use a little bit, and you'll find uh, bogus news stories, editorials, oral history transcripts. But the one that I had sprinkled throughout the book, but the one that I had the most fun with was, I really think, is chapter two, done in the style of Hunter S. Thompson and with Hunter S. Thompson's byline. He spends a week traveling around Oregon with President McCall, and I was able to weave in a lot of interesting stories that I think uh, add to the richness of his of the portrait of Tom McCall as a person. So chapter three opens with the scene in the Oval Office where Al Haig persuades uh, Richard Nixon to uh, move forward with the appointment of Tom McCall. And then the scene shifts to Oregon. On the opposite end of the continent, a couple of hours later, Ed Westerdahl was speeding down Interstate 5 approaching Oregon State Capitol of Salem. Westerdahl and his friend Ron Schmidt had helped McCall become Oregon's Secretary of State in 1964, and then win the governorship two years later. Westerdahl was puzzled by the phone call he had received from McCall, all but ordering him to come to the Capitol building. He found it strange that the normally voluble McCall refused to drop even the slightest hint about the reason for the call. Westerdahl parked in front of the late 30s marble edifice that served as Oregon's capital. He stepped through the heavy revolving door at the building's entrance and found himself in the rotunda, 
the bronze great seal of the state set into the center of the marble floor. Although he had been in this building every day for almost six years, it still filled him with a sense of awe. His gaze traveled upward from the seal to the soaring dome above. He paused briefly to glance at the huge murals portraying Oregon's pioneer heritage, then hurried to the governor's office on the second floor. What the hell is going on, Doris Westerdahl? asked Doris Penwell, the governor's executive secretary. She arched an eyebrow. All I know is he got a call from the White House first thing this morning. You'll have to find out the details yourself. He's got Ron in there with him waiting, but I don't think he's even told him yet. Westerdahl nodded, hesitating momentarily before pointing at Penwell's legs. Slaps, Doris, he asked. He wasn't used to seeing a woman wearing something other than a dress in a state office. New dress code, she said with a slight grin. You notice how cold it is in here? Westerdahl stepped into the cubbyhole where McCall did most of his work. The big office visitors saw was mainly for public ceremonies. The governor's back was turned toward his guests. He was looking out the window, apparently transfixed by the traffic on State Street below. Schmidt stood to greet his old colleague and friend. As he extended his hand, Schmidt nodded slightly in McCall's direction as he anticipated Westerdahl's question. No, nope, I don't know what's going on. He said he wanted to tell both of us at the same time. McCall swirled around in his chair. Westerdahl could see that his old boss's prominent jaw was set tight. What's this all about, Tom? McCall almost growled. Sit down, Ed. You're not going to believe this. Tom McCall had arrived at this moment because of his unique personality, skills, and achievements, but it didn't hurt that he looked the part of a governor. As a young man, McCall had been something of a string bean. Friends teasingly called him Ichabod Crane, but until not too long before, he had topped the scale at 230 pounds, which he wore well on his six foot five frame. The governor was 60 years old and still looked to be in his physical prime, despite having survived a very recent and very public bout with prostate cancer. He had broad shoulders, silver gray hair, an engaging smile, and penetrating blue eyes that truly reflected his state of mind at the moment, whether it be animated, restless, or troubled. Westerdahl was looking into the eyes of a man who was processing many things at once. Westerdahl settled into the chair and waited. He realized Penwell was right. The office was cold. The governor, who had ordered the heat turned down in all state buildings to help conserve energy, was wearing a tweed jacket over a blue cardigan. When the silence became uncomfortable, Westerdahl finally spoke. Well? When McCall spoke, he almost spat out the words. Al Haig called this morning. He wanted me to know they're considering me for vice president if Agnew resigns. Both men blanched. Once he absorbed the initial shock, Schmidt, Schmidt blurted, my God, Tom, do you know what this means? It means they want to stick me in the job Jack Garner said wasn't worth a bucket of warm piss. I thought he said warm spit, Westerdahl said. Uh, they sanitized it, McCall said, grinning. You know, that man spent eight years as vice president under Roosevelt, being a real pain in the keister to FDR, by the way. But do we remember him for anything other than that statement? Schmidt couldn't help but smile as well, but he didn't want the conversation to stray off course. That's not what I mean, Tom, and you know it. This means that you could be the next president of the United States. McCall turned so his back was to the two men again. He gazed out at the street below. Westerdahl and Schmidt sensed he needed to sort out the thoughts that were churning through his head. Ed, Ron, you know the only way Nixon is leaving the White House before the end of his term is in chains or a pine box. <laughs> McCall turned to face them once more. Oh, and Haig asked for my tax returns for the past 10 years, even though I'm sure they could get them from the IRS themselves. They want complete medical records. Want to make sure I'm clear of cancer. 
A pause. Why me? Why me? McCall demanded. Westerdahl knew that McCall expected and appreciated candor above all else. Well, Tom, you know how they've been calling Agnew Nixon's insurance policy for years. No one would ever impeach Nixon or try to kill him for fear of what they'd unleash with an Agnew presidency. I imagine they're looking at you the same way. You're too much of a wild card. McCall nodded in apparent agreement. He hunched forward and scowled as he furiously scribbled notes on a legal pad. Okay, so there you are with the first excerpt of the book. And beforehand, uh, we were looking at uh, some of the pictures of some of the McCall signature achievements, but more than those achievements, I think the McCall era created uh, an ethos, uh, an aura, uh, something that really set Oregon apart. Now, you may remember this sign. Some people actually think it was on the highways coming into Oregon. It was not. This was created by a group called the James G. Blaine Society. And that was a play on a famous statement that Tom McCall had made in 1971 uh, in a couple of different settings. Back then, the state's marketing slogan was, relax in a state of excitement. So Tom McCall stood at a podium and he repeated this in several interviews after. And he said, we want you to visit our state of excitement again and again. But for heaven's sake, don't move here to live. Or if you do move here to live, don't tell your friends where you went. <laughs> so the James D. Blaine Society played on that, as did the Oregon Unbreeding Card. And if you can't read that, it says, Tom Lawson McCall, governor, on behalf of the citizens of the great state of Oregon, cordially invites you to visit Washington, or California, or Idaho, or Nevada, or Afghanistan. <laughs> and I am really doubly thrilled, triply thrilled. James, if you wouldn't mind standing up, a special guest here today, and the man who brought the Oregon End greeting card says, James Lafayette. of work James created for the book. Last November, the Association of Counties, our annual convention in Eugene, the evening reception, I see James sitting there. I didn't know him at the time, but I saw his work on display, and I thought, oh my gosh, could it be? And sure enough, it was. And uh, I asked him, and he very graciously created an original piece of artwork for the book, and you will find that inside the book, but please. To begin with, uh, I need to let you know I'm a guitar member of the James G. Blaine Society. Uh, I knew uh, the uh, creator, a guy named Ron Adell, who was uh, at the university about the same time I was. Um, this particular card uh, is a couple of things that sort of followed up with this that uh, is never publicly mentioned anywhere. So. Consider yourself um, informed of something that's, that's, that's not really, really publicized. Um, a few months after the Oregon and greeting cards were up and running, uh, my partner, Frank Eason, who actually did most of the writing, I did all the artwork, created the, the cartoon character here, Hugh Wetshoe. <laughs> who is still still alive. He's been dozing for the last few years under some mushroom. <laughs> and he's coming back to life. We're, I'm going to be bringing him back here sometime, probably in the next few months. Anyway, um, one day at the office, Frank came in and said, you won't believe this. We got a... Well, first of all, let me back up. We checked with 
Tom called. We actually got a hold of Ron Schmidt, his press secretary, and said, is it okay if we use Tom's name on this card? We wanted to really make sure that we weren't stepping on anybody's toes, um, doing anything illegal. And uh, Ron Schmidt got back, said, oh yeah, the governor's gonna love it. So um, we used his name. And a few months later, Schmidt sent us a copy of a letter that he got, that the governor received. And this letter read something to the effect, Dear Governor McCall, my name is so-and-so. I was born and raised in Sile. Uh, ended up going to Oregon State University. And uh, about a year ago, I joined the Peace Corps. And they sent me to Afghanistan. <laughs> and I recently received one of these cards. And I just want you to know, Governor, we don't want those people here any at, at all. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the first story. The second story is, and I don't remember where I heard this, uh, but somebody told me they saw a car speeding up I-5 going through Eugene, the California place, and a handmade bumper sticker that said, it's okay, Tom, I'm just passing through. <laughs> brought a book so far, uh, got an Oregon End greeting card, your gift from James, and if anybody wants to buy one afterwards, as long as my supply lasts, uh, that's a free bonus for buying the book. So, thank you very much. So, in case you were wondering, yes, when Matt came up with the title, it was a direct tie-in to Portlandia, again, his theory being, and I think there's a lot of truth to it, that the whole McCall era, McCallandia sets the stage for Portlandia. So, another excerpt? Yeah. Okay. Hey, Bill. Yes. I'm sorry. I didn't yes, understand friend. what you just said. Portlandia and McCallandia. Right. Well, he said that, in other words, the whole McCall ethos, the uh, visit that don't stay, the green, the, we're different, and we like it that way, that if not for McCall and the McCall era, that probably Portlandia and the whole keep Portland weird, keep Portland special, keep Portland green, that wouldn't exist. And who is the guy you mentioned? Oh, did I say Matt? Oh, Matt Love. Oh, Matt. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so. This is not long after that scene in uh, the McCall office, and uh, there's a front page headline on the Register Guard announcing the news that McCall is under consideration for uh, the appointment. And uh, although, of course, McCall's the central figure of the book, I think there's a pretty entertaining supporting cast, as I mentioned, Hunter Thompson, Ken Kesey, who uh, in the McCall administration becomes the first and only U.S. Secretary of Counterculture. <laughs> <laughs> and even though I try to be logical, at least plausible, uh, John Lennon makes a couple of appearances in this book. <laughs> and in the world where Tom McCall became President of the United States, John Lennon did not die in 1980, and that's pure wish fulfillment. As is another uh, iconic Oregonian who makes several appearances in the book, and here is his first appearance, and he does not die young either. The news continued to filter its way around Oregon. For some who weren't closely attuned to political happenings and the deeper motives behind them, it took a while. A 22-year-old graduate of the University of Oregon with a bushy mustache and an intense stare, didn't hear about it until one of the customers at the bar he was tending, the paddock, his own favorite hangout, pointed the bold headline out to him the following <coughs> night. That part-time bartender, Steve Prefontaine, was living in a trailer with his German shepherd, Lobo, devoting all his energies toward vindication. Prefontaine picked up the paper, already wrinkled and stained from spilled beer, and tried to make out the story in the dim light and the haze of cigarette smoke. Cree owned every major distance record in the American running record books, 
but he had failed in his quest for the top prize at the 1972 Olympics in Munich, finishing a disappointing fourth in the 5,000 meters. He gave back to the community, spreading the gospel of fitness, <coughs> lecturing at local schools, and organizing a sports club at the state prison. But his laser focus was now on preparing for Montreal and the 1976 Summer Games. Still, he found the news about the governor to be intriguing. Prefontaine was noted for his bluntness and had little use for most politicians. McCall was an exception, though. In Pree's mind, McCall was different. That summed up most Oregonians' feelings toward their governor. McCall was different. Young and old, rich and poor, rural and urban, black and white, Republican and Democrat, Oregonians from every walk of life loved Tom McCall. And I think, I think that picture, another one of Jerry Lewin's classics, uh, really kind of captures that nicely. Uh, serving ice cream to students at a uh, grade school in Salem, which he did at least a couple of times during his governorship. I mean, that is a man who genuinely loves people. I mean, can you look at that picture and deny it? And I think that uh, certainly shines through there. So why do we admire Tom McCall? Why do we remember him? Certainly, he was a man of vision. And where does my admiration come from? OK, this is one of uh, the most precious items I own. That is my copy of Tom McCall Maverick. And in case you can't read it, it says Merry Christmas to Bill Hall from Tom McCall, December 12, 1977. My father picked that up for me. I actually had not met Tom McCall yet, though uh, that was not very far off. I had grown up and admiring Tom McCall during his governorship and was looking forward to 1978 and the opportunity he would have to try to win a third term as governor. That didn't work out, but I did volunteer in that campaign and I met Tom McCall three times and was able to introduce him at the campus of uh, Pacific University a couple of weeks before the election. And uh, just really one of the great experiences of my life and how things come full circle. And the research for the book, I interviewed his surviving son, Tad McCall, twice by telephone, had two very long conversations. And last month I got to meet Tad McCall for the first time. Tad lives in Arlington, Virginia, but uh, returns to Oregon often. And as a matter of fact, he's gonna be back uh, end of this month on April 29th. Governor Brown will be signing a bill that I wrote that declares March 22nd as Tom McCall Day and in Oregon from hereafter and encourages all school districts to make use of a curriculum that the Oregon Historical Society developed a couple of years ago designed to not only teach uh, young people about the history of their state but hopefully to inspire them and to uh, follow the lead and the legacy of Tom McCall. That is the ranch under the rim rock, and if that, the ranch in Central Oregon where Tom McCall grew up, and certainly I've got a lot in the book about uh, Tom McCall's youth, his, his family, and the inspirations that drove him, his great love and passion for the outdoors. <coughs> I mean, does anybody remember the famous film of Richard Nixon in a business suit and wingtips walking down the beach in California. <laughs> I mean, did you ever see anything that looked so phony? That is a real fisherman. And I was able to talk to a few people who went fishing with Tom McCall and got a few great stories about Tom McCall the fisherman. Also stories about Tom McCall the golfer and he liked to play at Salishans. Not everybody may know that McCall's had a weekend beach house at Rhodes Inn, just north of Lincoln City. 
And something I learned from Pat McCall that I had never seen in any published source is that uh, Tom McCall also liked to play tennis and said that his dad was a very aggressive player, mostly self-taught, some unusual trick shots he had developed himself, <laughs> and that he liked to play, you know, Tom liked to play against his son while Tad was growing up. He said, until I got big enough to start beating him regularly, and then his competitive nature, we just didn't play as much after that. <laughs> um, but really, the ranch was where it all started. I think his love of nature, he learned the sense of public service. He came from really a remarkable family. I mean, his mother, Dorothy McCall, anybody who remembers the McCall years, she was quite a force. The stories about Dorothy are legion. Both of his grandparents, his grandfather McCall, Samuel Walker McCall, was in Congress for Massachusetts for 20 years. And then after that was governor of Massachusetts for three two-year terms. His uh, grandfather Lawson, Thomas W. Lawson, who he was named after, was known as the Copper King. <coughs> At the beginning of the 20th century, they said that he controlled the entire supply of copper in the United States and had a net worth of $40 million. I mean, imagine that. And, I mean, that's... Uh, pretty good walking around money today, but uh, <laughs> that's an unimaginable fortune. And yet, when he died in 1925, he died broke. Mm -hmm. But uh, in addition to being a uh, millionaire businessman, both men, <coughs> you know, both uh, Thomas Lawson and Sam McCall were writers. And I think uh, that's where Tom McCall's love of the written word came from. And the house, you know, you might wonder how did uh, the child of, how did the children of two very prominent, wealthy uh, Massachusetts residents end up in uh, the wilds of uh, Central Oregon in the early 20th century? Well, Hal McCall, Tom's father, had this crazy dream of being a rancher, so the parents uh, staked them to that, but among other things, they equipped the, made sure the house was equipped with uh, all the finest fixtures, a library full of books, and um, let's see here. And so I still remember like a film clip of Tom McCall with uh, a friend of mine, Paul Hansen, a reporter, taking him through the house, pulls a book off the shelf uh, and says, Letters and Speeches of Oliver Cromwell. How'd you like to plow into that when you're six years old? <laughs> but uh, somebody asked me about uh, whether Tom McCall pardoned, President Tom McCall pardoned President Richard Nixon as uh, <coughs> President Gerald Ford did. Well, you'll have to read the book to find out. But <laughs> here is a little scene where I talk about McCall's approach to writing. And this was drawn from talking with several people who worked with him, several people who knew him, and then uh, thanks to a friend who actually worked for him in that 1978 campaign, I was able to go through a box of McCall manuscripts and papers. So they're talking about, they've made, the decision has been made and Ron Schmidt, his press secretary, chief speechwriter, says, I'll get started on a draft, Schmidt said. Their usual procedure for a speech of this magnitude was for Schmidt to produce a preliminary version, which McCall would then revise. But not this time. No, Ron, the president said, I need to do this one myself. I hope you understand. Schmidt nodded. He knew that McCall, the wordsmith, would want to make sure every word of the speech conveyed his personal conviction. Even before his love of the environment and his love of public service, Tom McCall had developed his love of words. Words mattered deeply to him. He wanted to make sure that he chose every one of them with extraordinary care on this occasion. 
Soon, McCall was ensconced in the small study he had established just off the Oval Office. This was reminiscent of his working office in Salem. The desk piled high with books and papers, his trusty royal manual typewriter sitting in the center of the desk, a well-thumbed dictionary within easy reach. He prided himself on never needing a thesaurus. The dictionary was the tool he used to make sure he chose exactly the right word. Don't touch anything or I won't be able to find anything, he sternly told his professional colleagues when they veered too close to his workspace. The same warning applied at the McCall home, where Tom's messy study stood in sharp contrast to the otherwise neat house that Audrey kept. Neatniks would never understand, but most people recognized that McCall's desks were a perfect reflection of his mind, forever overflowing with facts and ideas, passion spilling over the edges, an overarching vision that was too great to be contained in neat, orderly piles. Woodrow Wilson was the last president to write all his own speeches. Given the modern demands of the job, and with someone who understood his thought processes as well as, as, well as Schmidt close by, McCall wasn't going to try to revive that tradition. But this address was of singular importance. The president spread out the notes he had scribbled, rolled a piece of paper into the well-worn platen, and began hammering away with two fingers. This initial draft would be filled with strikeovers. The lowercase m hammered repeatedly with the president's strong right index finger and covered with additions and corrections in his scrawl. It would go through several iterations before a finished product was ready to be loaded on the Oval Office teleprompter. He worked late into the evening. Audrey finally called the White House kitchen to make sure that a soup and sandwich tray was delivered to her husband. Ah, you know, Tom McCall, probably best remembered for that visit, but don't stay, quote, but there are a couple of others that I like even more, and one of them, uh, probably about a year before he passed away, he was interviewed by the great journalist Studs Terkel, and one of the things he said to Studs Terkel was, heroes are not giant statues framed against a red sky. They're people like you and me who say, this is my community and it's my responsibility to make it better. And that, I think, is the legacy of Tom McCall. And one more excerpt and then if people want to ask questions, I'd be glad to entertain questions. And this is another genuine Tom McCall quote, although I have uh, changed the setting in this story. It happens a few months after it, ha it happened in real life, and it happens uh, in a different place. Now in reality, that is the sign that used to greet visitors coming into Oregon and from California on I-5. In 1982, uh, Governor Vicatia came up with the idea of replacing it with a sign that simply said, Welcome to Oregon. And he asked Tom McCall to come to that ceremony, which he did, and he, but he was pretty much unrepentant to the end. Now, in this version of reality, you'll hear the same Tom McCall words, but it's a different setting. It is also October of 1982, but it is a pre-election rally in Portland, and it is supporting uh, Bud Clark, the Portland mayor, who is a candidate for governor and is running with former governor and former president Tom McCall's endorsement. And as in real life, Tom McCall is near the end of his life due to the advance of his prostate cancer. As he hesitantly stepped to the podium, McCall couldn't help but think back to a similar rally almost six years earlier to the day. That had been a day of triumph. He was the incumbent president of the United States, about to win the endorsement of the nation for a term in his own right. He was still healthy, even vigorous. The future still stretched to the horizon and beyond. It had been a sunny, unseasonably warm day. Now, the setting of the sun was in sight. Fall was in the air, 
and the overcast skies threaten to unleash moisture at any moment. The end for McCall might be months away, or it might only be days. He had to ration these precious moments carefully, not only to preserve his cherished land use program, again I'll veer off here because as in our real timeline, there was an attempt in 1982 to repeal the state land use program and Tom McCall rallied with his last strength to uh, stop that. But also to help define the land he loved. His energies were ebbing, but his command of language was as strong as ever. He told the crowd, there's been a lot of bad mouthing about visit but don't stay. It served its purpose. We were saying, visit but don't stay, because Oregon, Queen Bee though she is, is not ready for the swarm. McCall paused. Most of those truly feeling and understanding the gravity of the moment thought he was reaching within himself for whatever limited reserves he had left. They were wrong. He was summoning energy, as he always did, from the people and the natural beauty that surrounded him. His former Secretary of Counterculture had once called Oregon a citadel of the spirit. Ken Kesey had drawn on these people, this land, to do wondrous and beautiful things in his art and his life. Tom McCall thought Kesey was right, but he took it a step further. He believed that Oregon itself was a wondrous spirit, that somehow the land, water, skies, and people melded to form something greater than the sum of their parts, something almost indescribable in its beauty. He knew how to summon this energy when he needed it. His plea to all who could hear his voice was simple, that they loved this fragile place with the same devotion that he did. I am simply saying that Oregon is demure and lovely, and it ought to play a little hard to get. And I think you'll all be just as sick as I am if you find it is nothing but a hungry hussy throwing herself at every stinking smokestack that's offered. <laughs> had our battles back and forth, but Oregon has not yet become that hungry hussy, and that is the triumph of Tom McCall. <laughs>
Thanks. You had an opportunity to interview and talk with a number of his former staff. Right. Tell us about a little bit about that. Well, you know, I mentioned uh, Doris Penwell in that scene, the opening scene. She was uh, Ann Westerdahl's secretary during his first term, and then Tom McCall's secretary in the second term. And she gave me all kinds of great information. That was just one example, talking about how the energy crisis and turning down the thermostats finally led to the relaxation of the dress code and women or of course, could actually wear slacks to the office in the state capitol. And, uh, oh, I talked to uh, Jacob Cantor, a remarkable man who is approaching 90, still practicing law, part-time in Portland. Uh, Tom McCall appointed him to both the State Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court. But before that, he was actually the state, the very first director of the Consolidated what was then called State Department of Human Resources, but later renamed Department of uh, Human Services. Uh, Daryl Butis, who was another one of his aides, uh, told me some great stories that are worked into the book. And how about if I share one that I didn't get into the book? And uh, about, let's see, what is it? Daryl Butis is at home in Salem, about one o'clock in the morning, and Tom McCall is at a conference in Atlanta, and so the phone rings, and it's Governor McCall, and Daryl is really surprised because you know he's thinking, gosh, it's like four o'clock in the morning in Atlanta, and he says, Daryl, would you, I've been trying to call home all night, and Audrey isn't answering. I hate to ask this of you, but would you mind going over there and seeing if she's okay? And so he gets in his car and he drives over to the governor's house and there and he goes around to the back door where he knows a state police guard will be on duty and the guard knows him and uh, even knows where the spare key is hidden. So he lets himself into the house and he comes in saying, Mrs. McCall, Mrs. McCall, are you here? You know, and finally he spots a lone light on upstairs and uh, she knocks gently on the door and says, uh, Mrs. McCall, it's Daryl Butis. And she says, oh, come on in, Daryl. And Audrey McCall is sitting up in bed reading and she said, and Daryl Butis says, well, the governor called me and said he's been calling and uh, he hadn't been answering the phone and he was concerned. And he said, Audrey just smiled sweetly and said, yes, I'm mad at the governor and so I'm not speaking to him tonight. <laughs> I will talk to him in the morning. <laughs> hey, uh, Tom and Audrey McCall were married for 39 years and totally devoted to each other. But you know how the best of relationships. You have your moments. Oh, I should share the visual aid that I bought. Uh, just last month I was asked to talk about Tom McCall to a political collector's group. And I have a few original McCall brochures and bumper stickers and just a couple of extras on some of them. And one member of the group had an extra, there was a series of four posters produced for the 1970 McCall re-election campaign. And he had... Oh, okay, no, I see one. Can everybody see it? Yeah. Yeah. There was a series of four of these, all with the slogan, Keep Oregon, Oregon, Keep Tom McCall. Mm -hmm. So I'm pretty thrilled to have this, as you can imagine, just as I'm thrilled to have that wonderful Prefontaine print. Now I'm going to have to find a frame for that as well. And I think that'll be part of my traveling show. Yes, Fran? So you mentioned um, the governor signing a, a bill so it's already passed through the legislature? Yes. So you Did might want to talk about what does that do? And yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty simple and uh, I structured it in a way that uh, I hope there wouldn't be any objections and there weren't. It simply says March 22nd, Tom McCall's birthday is officially recognized by the state as Tom McCall Day. It's not a 
holiday for, you know, paid holiday, another day off or anything like that, but it's just official state recognition that Tom McCall was one of the great leaders of Oregon history, encouraging all Oregonians to remember his legacy and specifically encouraging, again, not requiring, because I knew even that could produce a battle, all school districts to make use of this Oregon Historical Society curriculum. Yes? Where was the family homestead? You said Central Oregon. Just exactly where was it? Oh, it's, you know, I've never been there, and that's somewhere where I need to go, but I think it's right near Prineville. Oh, Prineville. Okay. Yeah. Right. Rimrock. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, sir. In actual history, uh, Terry Ford's choice of a vice president was axed by his own party in 1976, and then another vice presidential. Did you, did you get into the book what Tom Small chose? as his vice president. Oh, I sure did. Uh -huh. and, and reasoning? Yeah, actually, uh, I'll tell you, yeah, he chose two different vice presidents, uh, much as Ford did, although one Ford's didn't make it, that initially when McCall moves up to the presidency, he has to appoint a new vice president, just as Ford did, and he makes the same choice, Nelson Rockefeller because Tom McCall was a huge admirer of Nelson Rockefeller, felt he was a great leader, felt he was presidential material. But uh, again, a little different twist. Instead of being forced off the ticket, basically for personal reasons, Rockefeller decides not to uh, run on the 1976 ticket, and McCall ends up making a very unconventional choice for the 1976 vice presidential. I think you'll <laughs> enjoy it, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Uh, this is a $64,000 question. Okay. As it's probably in the book. Uh, were he alive, if he were alive today, what do you think he would think of the Oregon, uh, the state of the Oregon environment? Ooh, that's a good one. <laughs> uh, you know, he was a fierce <laughs> champion of the environment, and yet I also think he was a pragmatist in some ways. I mean, his son last month was telling me a story about in his first term when they were dedicating a new dam that uh, had provided sufficient water to allow the uh, Warm Springs tribe to develop the Panita Resort. And in his speech, he said something about, and I hope this will be the last <laughs> noose around the neck of the Columbia, words to that effect, and, he, and Tad McCall said you could see Vice President Humphrey recoil a bit at that. And yet, you know, he said his dad had supported that dam, even though he was fully aware, probably more than most political leaders, of the harm that dams could cause. But he felt that the economic plight of the Warm Springs people was so severe that they really needed uh, a tool like this. Oh, I think. <sighs> Tom McCall could come back right now. I think he'd be really pleased that the land use planning system has survived and survived multiple challenges. I think he would look at uh, the Oregon wine industry and say, see? Because, you know, when that bill was going through in 1973, I think only a few people were really aware of the potential of the Lamont Valley as one of the really great, great growing places in the entire world. And if we hadn't had land use planning in place, I think a lot of those uh, great fields would have been uh, gobbled up by subdivisions. You know, I think he'd look and see, you know, he'd probably be asking why we hadn't extended the bottle bill beyond soft drinks and beer. I think he'd be kind of concerned that maybe Oregon had lost its way, lost its position of leadership and saying, why aren't we a leader anymore? Why aren't we an innovator anymore? Why can't we do better? Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. This has been a lot of fun.